So you want to start a career using your animals to educate people, but you don't really know where to begin. Well, today I'm going to give a few tips just from my own personal experience so that you can lead the glorious life of a reptile educator. And here's a freebie, just a free one right off the bat. You better grow to love the taste of frozen pizza and Insta Ramen because you ain't going to make much money. This is Roxy, the Cuban rock iguana, and I am Adam the human. I started Uncharted Wild, which is a business where I go around educating people about exotic animals, uh, going on just almost six years ago now. And I've been involved with animal education for about eight and a half years. I volunteered and interned and worked at different zoos and other education facilities and things like that before I started this. I wouldn't say I'm an expert in running or starting an animal related small business, definitely nothing like a breeder or anything like that. But I like to think I've learned a few things in my almost decade of doing this. Now this is not going to be a video about how to start a reptile related YouTube channel. I mean, I've only been on YouTube for about nine months or something like that, not even a year. So I wouldn't really feel like it's my place to tell other people how to start their channels or anything like that so what with what I do I been doing it for almost a decade now so I feel very comfortable kind of giving some pointers for that and with YouTube it's a completely different skill set it's I mean some of the things we're gonna talk about today do cross over with starting a reptile YouTube channel but I mean you have to worry about lighting you have to worry about editing you have to worry about a bunch of stuff on the computer stuff to do with the camera and all that other stuff that I don't have to worry about when I'm doing school shows or birthday parties or things like that. So today we're just going to focus on what I do when I'm not in front of a camera. I have 60 or so exotic species that I take to my programs. I have reptiles, I have amphibians and vertebrates. I have a bird, which you might be able to hear. She's just off camera over there. I have mammals. I have a whole bunch of animals and you can go back on the channel and learn about a bunch of them. But I take these animals to birthday parties, schools, retirement communities, churches, fairs, festivals, really anywhere that wants to learn about animals. And today I'm not going to be getting into like the real nitty gritty of what you have to worry about when starting an animal business like if you have to worry about insurance or in uh, taxes and tax write-offs I'm not going to be talking about actually declaring and starting a business in your state or country the kind of legal things you have to worry about like declaring in a newspaper which I had to do I had to file with the state government and I have to pay a fee every two years all that kind of stuff I'm not really gonna dive into that today I'm just gonna give you kind of five all-around tips that I think will kind of help guide you on the right path so my first tip is going to be something that you really want to do for anything in life before you jump into it and that's research you need to be very thorough and look up a bunch of different stuff because there's gonna be a lot of things when you're dealing with this kind of career path that you are going to need to know that you might not have anticipated needing to know. Don't be the person to just buy a few snakes and start going around to schools uninsured without a huge know-how of what you're doing and what could potentially happen just to teach people about reptiles. I mean, your intentions might be pure, but there's going to be a few things you need to worry about. Like if a snake bites a kid, you're in a bunch of legal trouble. The school is most likely never going to have another animal act come again because of this experience. And I've run into this many times with schools where they wouldn't book me or it was very, very strict with booking me because of bad experience they've had in the past and also you're going to further hurt the public perception of snakes and reptiles and you're going to also further hurt people like myself that have insurance know what we're doing are an actual legal business and my whole job the whole reason I do what I do is to educate people about reptiles and other exotic animals spiders scorpions whatever so that they learn about them and they're not as scared of them but if I have people going around just doing whatever they want and animals are hurting kids accidentally or bad things happen, then that is going to make it that much more difficult for valid organizations like myself and others that know what we're doing and can be safe and all this other stuff to get bookings and further our message and actually help the public opinion of reptiles. You need to know your area. You need to look up the schools and libraries, museums, and other venues in your area to see if you can even support a business part-time as a side thing, let alone if you're trying to do it full-time like I do. That's going to take a lot of shows year to try and live off of this full time. So you need to make sure you actually have the kind of resource base of people wanting to book you in order to try this. You need to know if there are other animal educators already operating in your area. If you're going to be the seventh reptile education business that opens up shop in your area, are you really going to get that many bookings? Are you going to be able to differentiate yourself enough from the others in order for yourself to get some bookings? You also need to look into most likely a sizable, reliable car, especially if you start getting kind of bigger reptiles 
reptiles as people kind of go along and get Burmese pythons and things like that as they get bigger, you're going to need a lot of space in your car to transport these animals. So you're going to need some type of reliable vehicle. And this is even without the hours and hours of research you're going to have to do, like I said, with the legalities, with taxes, tax write-offs, insurance, actually starting a business in your area. I'm not going to dive into that because it varies so wildly depending on what city, state, country, providence, whatever you're in. So that's all going to vary. So that's on you to look up. And on top of all of this, you need to actually know the care and information about the animals that you're taking and using in your programs. You need to be able to answer questions on them. You need to be able to give them good care, house them properly, feed them properly. Because if you bring in a bunch of animals that look stressed out, half dead, super underweight, sick, then you most likely are not going to get booked again. Now my second tip is going to be something that you run into anytime you have an occupation dealing with a lot of people and talking to them, and that's good public speaking skills. You need to be able to present your information in a good way to sometimes very large groups of crowds without kind of getting scared or fumbling your words constantly. If you look at certain reptile YouTube channels that have really blown up and become very successful, like Clint's Reptiles or Wiccan's Wicked Reptiles, I think one of the things that both of those channels do very, very well is obviously they're very good at speaking. They're very good at taking information and relaying it to their audience in a way that is easy to digest and it's flowing. And I mean, if it, it comes from their background. If you look at Clint, he's a college professor, he has a PhD. He is very comfortable and used to talking to students and relaying a lot of complex information to them in a way that they can understand and learn from it. And if you look at Adam from WWR, he's a stand-up comedian. So I mean, he's very comfortable standing in front of people, relaying stories, relaying information that way. And I mean, comedians, they're gonna have a much harder crowd to impress than I do when I take iguanas to a bunch of kindergartners to show them the cool animals. And one thing that sort of bridges the gap between what I do in person and what myself and other reptile YouTubers do here on the, on the platform is it's live. You can't edit things. You can't do multiple takes. You can't kind of cut things out if you mess up your words or you fumble a bunch of your words, or you have a bad take, or if your animals kind of mess things up while you're trying to talk. This is Roxy, a Cuban rock iguana. I am Adam Human, and I started Uncharted Wild. Certain reptile, no. Where are you going? Oh no! Oh. <laughs> Here on YouTube, you'd have no idea that those things happen because I can just cut them out. You have no idea how many takes I've done, how many times I've said these same exact words I'm saying right now because I look for the best take, the best version of me saying these things. You can't do that in person. And one thing that helps a lot with this is repetition. Some of my animals like Maui, my Sulcata tortoise, Norman, my tegu, uh, Drax, my African giant bullfrog. I bring these animals to just about every program that I do for years. So in, the, in my head, it's hardwired. I know the stories, the facts, the background information, the anecdotes. I know the general flow and pattern of everything that I'm going to say because I've done it so many times. And that's just something that you'll learn as you do this, as you kind of do shows and more and more shows, you're comfortable saying things in front of people, talking about these animals you're going to learn that and this leads into just being really good at improvising having good improvisational skills like if you do fumble your words say a little off the cuff Bleh, I can speak English well or something like that get a little chuckle out of the kids and you can get right back in your groove of what you were saying also this is a profession where you are dealing with animals and children together so those are like the two most unpredictable forces in nature and you're combining them while trying to talk to a bunch of people publicly. So it can sometimes lead to very interesting, hard to predict results. Say you're doing a school show and you have a kid that's being disruptive, he's being a smart aleck, he's trying to be the class clown, make all of his friends laugh. Say you're doing an animal program and your iguana decides to take a big dump right all over your lap and uh, you have to deal with that in the middle of a show. That last one is totally nothing from my own personal experience and is totally unrelated to why I have a spare pair of pants in my car for every public show I do now. One last thing about public speaking is you need to be able to bring what you're saying down to different age levels, different levels of understanding. If you look at what a third grader and a first grader knows, a lot of people are like, oh, elementary school. But no, the difference between those two years can be very extreme. They can understand very different concepts. So you need to be able to adjust and say what you wanna say in a way that's engaging to older kids, but also that younger kids can understand, especially if you're doing like an assembly show where you have grades kindergarten up through seventh grade or something like that. You wanna keep everyone as engaged as best you can. Next up, and this sort of ties in with any business you're going to do, whether it's animal breeding, animal education, even non-animal jobs is 
professionalism. If you want to be taken seriously as the kind of weird person that has a basement full of reptiles that you take to show kids, then you need to carry yourself and handle yourself professionally. Otherwise you are just the kind of weird person with a basement full of reptiles that you take to show kids. And this could be any number of things. And some of these things I didn't even have for the first few years when I got started because they kind of just come as you naturally grow your business. Things like business cards, having a shirt with your name or logo on them, having a nice, clean, easy to navigate website or Facebook page, having a bunch of reviews on that page from people that rate you five out of five stars. They love what you do. They've seen your show. They appreciate what you do. They want to book you again. I mean, all of these things just kind of build your professional image build this, this is my business, this is what I do, I love what I do, this is not a hobby, and I'm really good at what I do. Building up a rapport with anyone that books you, schools, libraries, getting multiple bookings consistently every year, going back and doing these same places, having kids and families that go to those same shows looking forward to seeing you. I can't tell you how many programs I've done where the kids have seen me three, four, five times and they ask about animals specifically. They're like, how's Norman? How's Roxy? How's Jade? They know these animals, they're excited to see these animals, and they're excited to see what else I might bring. Parents, teachers, librarians, people that are responsible for booking you will know that these kids look forward to it they might be getting asked about these kids hey when is so and so with the animals coming back and this all just lends to you getting booked more keeping more money in your pockets to feed the animals being able to sustain yourself on this business and again just looking more and more like an actual professional business and just not just some person that has some animals and comes around sometimes communicating well replying in a timely manner to inquiries via text email voicemail whatever showing up early being ready to go on if not early but on the exact time that you're supposed to go on that anything you can do all of these things will help you get more bookings another part of this specifically when dealing with kids is patience you need to be patient because kids can be weird they can be goofy they can be excited sometimes depending on the age range they might get very scared easily might even cry so they're all different and when you put them in a setting that's already kind of high energy and a lot of sugar like birthday parties and things sometimes the results can be very explosive and one kid being super excited can be contagious and all of a sudden you have a bunch of kids screaming and moving and things like that so you just need to be patient you need to deal with kids as kind of calmly as you can. Don't let any irritation or annoyance or anything seep into your voice or how you act. And parents and teachers will see this. They'll see how well you interact with the kids. They'll see this and if you do it really well, they want to have you back because you're good with their kids. Fourth tip is you need to know how to market yourself because when you first start out, no one's gonna know who you are or what you do. So you need to be able to kind of get yourself out there and start getting programs. My first year, I think I only did 10 shows and now, well, pre-COVID, I was doing that in a week over the summer. So, I mean, I was getting 150, 200 plus shows a year. So, I mean, it can really blow up depending on how well your name spreads and how well people kind of receive what you do and how eager they are to book you. I think my first show is for my mom's best friend's daughter's birthday. So, I mean, I just kind of did any show I could. Parents, families, things like that. Everyone's got to start somewhere. I took little flyers with my number and stuff and I pinned them on community boards and gas stations and pet stores and vets, really anywhere that would let me. And I think the whole time I did that, which I did that for, I think the entire first year, I think the whole time I did that, I only got a single show out of it, but still, it was more shows than I had than if I didn't do it. When I first got started, there were a few shows that I did for free or severely discounted because I thought the venues or the exposure was worth it. and. That's kind of a slippery slope for any artist or performer to get into the habit of doing shows for free just to kind of get your name out there. Because I mean, it can really help when you first get going, but the problem is, is if it kind of becomes commonplace, if the place that was booking you for $25 for a show, suddenly you raise your rates to what you think is normal and they're gonna be like, we're not gonna pay this, you used to do it for basically free. You gotta know your worth. You know your worth, you put your prices at what you think they should be at. And I mean, luckily I do that. I I did shows that I used to do for free or discounted and I'm like, no, this is my price now. And a lot of people still book me because they think that the price is worth what they get. Word of mouth goes so far. I mean, it, say you do one show at a library, boom, that's like 30 kids right there. Say 
Four of those kids want to have you for your birthday party. Two of them do end up booking you. So then you go and do shows for those birthdays. And I bring kind of newer animals so the parents don't think they're just seeing the same thing twice. And then from that birthday party, say one of the kid's parents is a teacher at a school. So then you get into the school and it just, it's just a chain that can keep going and going and going. And you just get more and more bookings out of it as long as you keep doing a good job. And I have a giant Excel file that I keep track of all the shows that I do. I, keep track of what program they book and where they're from and things like that, addresses and stuff. And then I also keep track of how they heard about me, whether it was a rebooking, whether it was from another program, whatever it was. Because at the end of the day, with so many animals, that means you have a lot of mouths to feed. And I mean, I'm not like a breeder where I have like 40 corn snakes or 80 crested geckos or something like that that I'm breeding and selling. These are all different animals, different sizes. I have several large lizards, monitor lizards, iguanas, tegus, they eat a lot. The mammals, you gotta do bedding and feeding and all that stuff, that is a lot because they eat and poop a lot more than the reptiles do. The parrot is a lot. You have to buy these cages and everything to keep them in, these in the tanks and everything. So it's just, it is a lot of money. So you need to be able to make enough to kind of subvert that and also if you wanna do this full time, enough for yourself to kind of pay for your own food and stuff off of. Because if I wasn't doing this full time for a living, there's no way I would have 70 plus animals. If I had a full time 40 to 50 hour job outside of any of this animal related stuff, then coming home to take care of 70 animals would be absolute insanity. I wouldn't have anywhere near this amount of animals, which kind of brings me to my last point. The last thing I talk about in a video about starting an animal education business is getting the animals or getting the right animals, I should say. Certain reptiles can make really awesome, cool pets, but maybe they aren't the best for what I do. Maybe it's the traveling. Maybe it's they don't like being in front of a hundred plus people being stared at. Maybe it's they just don't like being handled in general. If you look at a lot of the kind of very common, good or even intermediate beginner pet reptiles, a lot of them are really good for what I do. Redfoot tortoises, Russian tortoises, leopard and crested geckos, bearded dragons, corn snakes, milk snakes, rat snakes, boa constrictors, all these animals make really good pets and they make really good education animals for kind of the same reasons where they're pretty chill, they're easy to take care of, they're pretty hardy, they're easy to kind of move around, they're finally being handled. Then there are species that can be pretty difficult to take care of or house as a pet, but can still make really good education animals like certain tortoise species, iguanas, tegus, uh, rainbow boas, water dragons, things like that. And then there are reptiles that are just very difficult to care for pets and also really don't do well with this line of work. One of the biggest ones being chameleons. I get asked, all the time if I have a chameleon. Chameleons for the most part don't really want to be picked up at all, let alone packed up and then brought to be stared at by hundreds of people and sometimes very close. They don't really like being handled and a lot of, most of them are all very care intensive. They have very specific care requirements that even a lot of keepers with a couple years of experience can have a hard time dealing with. Then there are some difficult reptiles that I do own but don't go to programs, the chief among them being Simon, my ornate monitor lizard, who will probably never go to a program because he is very testy. And I've gotten to the point where he's fine with me for the most part, but I never handle him. I never take him out or anything. We are not at that point And I've been working with him for almost a year and a half now. So we're at the point where he'll come up onto my shoulder and check me out. But I don't think I'll ever get to the point where I can actually put him in a travel container and bring him places. So that just won't end well. And then there are smaller animals that just make better display animals. They're too quick or too little to try and mess with handling like annals or my day gecko. And then there's also ones that are just fully aquatic like my axolotls. I can't really bring my axolotls many places. You also have to be able to transport these animals. I mean, everyone loves big reptiles like Burmese pythons, water monitors, big tortoises. Kids go nuts for a big tortoise. Everyone loves a big 150 pound cute sulcata tortoise, but it can get very taxing on the body to pack up and bring a giant heavy tortoise like that to a bunch of shows. Or a Burmese python that weighs 80 pounds trying to get it into its travel tote. I mean, these are all things you have to consider when you get these animals. It's a big animal. It's going to be very impressive at a big stage show and people are going to love it, but it's not as easy to move as it is a smaller iguana or a bearded dragon or a corn snake. One last thing with your animals is you have to know what you're gonna talk about because everyone loves bearded dragons, everyone loves petting bearded dragons, the programs are awesome, but there's not a whole lot to talk about with them compared to like all the facts you can say about a tegu 
or with tortoises. A Russian tortoise is cute and you can pet it, but I have way more to talk about with my pancake tortoises, with their weird flexible shells, their critical endangered status, how they only lay like one egg a year, things like that. So certain animals just lend themselves to talking about more important things like conservation and things like that through education than some of the more commonplace pets like leopard geckos and stuff like that. So I think you need to find a mix between animals that do really well being handled and touched and everything by kids without stress and maybe a few special animals like my snapping turtle or things where the kids don't get to touch it but they get to look at it. It looks really cool. They get to see it up close and they get to learn about a really cool animal even though they don't necessarily get to touch that animal. So those were five tips that I have for anyone wanting to start their animal education business. I get asked about this a lot, so I figured it'd be a really good video topic. Hey, who knows, if this video does really well, maybe I'll do a whole series on it where I'll just break each tip down into an entire video and really deep dive into that topic. So if that'd be something you're interested in, comment down below, let me know. Like the video if you learned something. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on any of our weekly videos that I do every Thursday. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll catch you later.